Chapter 20 had a lot of anatomy. We did get this third equation, and we could talk about all three equations now and discuss the homeostatic regulation of blood pressure. We also discussed how organs could undergo autoregulation and change their own blood flow. We also discussed regulation by the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Both could affect heart rate, whereas only the sympathetic could affect peripheral resistance. Changes in vasoconstriction or vasodilation could cause one of two responses. One, it could cause a change in systemic blood pressure. Or two, we could see redirection of blood flow, either to the muscles or to the digestive tract. An abnormal blood clot that is fixed in position is called a thrombus. If it gets dislodged and starts to travel through the circulatory system, we call it an embolus. An embolus will ultimately get lodged in a small artery or capillary somewhere, which could either block blood flow or even cause the blood vessel to burst. What organ might be affected depends on where the blood clot originated. For instance, a deep vein thrombosis in the legs, if it were to dislodge, would travel up one of the large veins in the leg, such as the great saphenous vein. This would join up with the external iliac, which joins up to form the common iliac, which becomes the inferior vena cava, which returns to the right side of the heart. From the right atrium, this blood clot would travel to the right ventricle, up the pulmonary trunk, and then out one of the pulmonary arteries. As it travels down the arteries, they get smaller and smaller and smaller, and it's here that that blood clot might get lodged, causing a pulmonary embolism. There's no other direction that a blood clot in the leg could travel. On the other hand, if a patient has a heart attack, they could develop a thrombus in the left side of the heart. And if this were to get dislodged, it would travel up the aorta and possibly up one of the carotid arteries up towards the brain where it could cause a stroke or a cerebral vascular accident. Here are the three equations that we need to understand. Don't let them scare you too much. They really aren't that, hey, dude, quit it. You're not helping. Go away. Okay. As I was saying, don't let them scare you too much. We really just need to understand what all of these values mean. And if one thing goes up or down, what happens to the rest? First of all, the brain is only capable of measuring blood pressure. If there's a change in blood pressure, the sympathetic or the parasympathetic nervous systems can only affect a few of these values. We could speed up or slow down heart rate, and we could also change peripheral resistance. Sympathetic stimulation also can decrease ESV and indirectly increase EDV, so those can also change. Everything else is derived from those values. For instance, if somebody is in really good aerobic health, their heart is probably pretty strong, and it squeezes harder than average. That means ESV should be lower. Because the heart is squeezed harder, there should be less blood left over in the ventricles when it is done. That will lead to an increase in stroke volume, which would lead to an increase in cardiac output, which would lead to an increase in blood pressure. However, the brain detecting this increase in blood pressure would lower sympathetic tone and increase parasympathetic tone, which should lead to a drop in resting heart rate. And sure enough, you probably don't need these equations to tell you that people who are in good shape have a lower resting heart rate. Conversely, if somebody has a heart attack and it damages their heart muscle, the heart will be weaker. This would lead to an increase in ESV. Subtracting a larger number would lead to a drop in stroke volume, which would lead to a drop in cardiac output, which would lead to a drop in blood pressure. The brain would not be okay with this and instead would activate sympathetic tone, which will lead to an increase in heart rate. 
This is not a good long-term solution, so our patient who's just had their heart attack and survived really should go to the hospital to seek further medical care. Lastly, you need to be absolutely clear why aerobic exercise is so healthy for the human body, especially the cardiovascular system. First off, we learned last quarter that muscles, when they undergo aerobic activity for prolonged periods of time, tend to increase their myoglobin content, their number of mitochondria, and increased angiogenesis occurs. This will lead to the growth of more blood vessels around the heart. This, in turn, means that if one of those blood vessels gets clogged with an embolus, there are still plenty of others to deliver blood throughout the entire heart. This means a healthier heart. Similarly, muscles grow stronger. With aerobic exercise, the cardiac muscle also grows stronger, which means it squeezes harder, which means that ESV tends to go down. And as we saw on the previous page, that can lead to a homeostatic response of lowering resting heart rate while maintaining the correct blood pressure. A lower resting heart rate means the heart does not have to work as hard and therefore should last longer. 